Hello and welcome to KDK's debate between the candidates for U.S. Senate in Pennsylvania. I'm Ken Rice from KDK TV News. I'll be serving as moderator. Let's welcome the candidates. Republican Congressman Lou Barletta of Hazleton, who has served four terms in the U.S. House, and the incumbent Democratic Senator Bob Casey of Scranton, running for a third term in the U.S. Senate. I'm joined in questioning the candidates by my KDK TV News colleagues, Money and Politics Editor John Delano, and reporter and talk show host Lynn Hayes Freeland. Here are the rules for our debate. The candidates will have one minute for answers and an additional 30 seconds for rebuttal. The questioners may jump in with follow-ups and we'll make sure the response times are equal. And finally, each candidate will have 90 seconds to deliver a closing statement. And so gentlemen, let's begin. As we speak right now, there has been an arrest in the series of explosives sent to high profile Democrats and critics of President Trump. We have nothing official as we speak right now on a motive. Nonetheless, we have all heard from leaders and lawmakers in both parties over the past few days pointing out that hateful rhetoric inevitably leads to real life danger, that hate acts follow hate speech. Who do you consider, and Mr. Casey, this goes to you first, who do you consider to be the main source of hate speech in our country right now, and do you have a message for them? Well, first of all, Ken, I want to say that we're happy that there's a suspect who's been apprehended. Uh, we have to make sure as well that not only is that individual prosecuted to the full extent of the law, but anyone else involved so that we can get to the bottom of this and prevent it from happening again. And that should be, I think, a unifying message for the country. But look, th there's no question that in our political culture right now, we have an, an awful lot of sharp edge rhetoric. And it, it happens across the board. I have to say, though, the president, because of what has happened, I hope would take affirmative steps uh, to, to lead in the direction not just of unifying the country to be able to, to get to the bottom of this particular threat, and this is a, this is a, a, a threat that is uh, domestic terrorism, but I hope the, the president would lead by example uh, by lessening the, the negative tone of his rhetoric, and that's true of any public official. Mr. Barletta. You know, that, that shouldn't be tolerated at any place. I mean, we, we saw what happened uh, on the baseball field of practice when Steve Scalise uh, w was shot. And, uh, you know, it's just come to a level, you know, the political discourse in this country has come to a level where people will do anything for power. They'll do anything to get elected. They'll say anything. They'll hurt anybody. And, and listen, I don't think we can say one person in Washington is responsible. We're all adults. I don't think the president needs to lecture us on how, to, on how we should act. We're, we should be responsible for ourselves and what we say and, and realize that they all have consequences. And let's not start pointing fingers even when we're trying to uh, really calm, it, calm everything down. Fair enough. Uh, next question, John Delano for Lou Barletta. Mr. Barletta, after dozens of attempts to repeal Obamacare, which protects those with pre-existing medical conditions Republicans are now claiming that they never really meant to deny insurance coverage or to raise premiums for those with cancer and the like. Now, this is personal to a lot of folks, as it is to you and to me. My wife is a breast cancer survivor. Rather than focus on what you may or may not have done in the past, can you pledge tonight that if you are elected to the United States Senate, you will never vote to repeal Obamacare with these protections or support any bill that would deny health insurance or raise premiums for anyone with pre-existing conditions? Sure, I can easily say that, John, because I already did that. Uh, when we repealed Obamacare, the next day I uh, signed a resolution that would say that the committees that are responsible for replacing uh, Obamacare would, would make sure we take care of people with pre-existing conditions. Uh, the, the replacement model that we passed was very clear in law that you cannot deny people with pre-existing conditions, you cannot uh, raise their premiums, and you cannot throw them off. That covered 93%. The 7% who did let their insurance lapse that were not covered, we made sure that, that went back to the state when they went to buy insurance that we had a pot of money, a high-risk pool, that would cover those folks that did the exact same thing. So I don't think there's anybody in Washington that wants to deny anyone pre-existing conditions. It's a good political argument, and I see my opponent has taken much advantage of it in scaring people who are sick. Yes, I will pledge that, uh, that I would never support anything that doesn't cover people with pre-existing conditions. Mr. Casey, same question. 
John, there's no question I would make that pledge. I've already voted consistent with that, that pledge. But here's what we're talking about. We're talking about 5.3 million people in Pennsylvania that have a pre-existing condition. Virtually any room you walk into is probably 40% of the people in the room. This is real life for so many families. We have to make sure that the law of the land, which it is now, it wasn't before uh, the Affordable Care Act, where insurance companies could discriminate by way of coverage and deny you coverage, but also they could discriminate by charging you higher rates. The law of the land now is that pre-existing conditions protections uh, are in place. There should be no effort by any public official to take that away. Unfortunately, the congressman has at least seven votes that would, that would deny people lo these kinds of protections. The, the, the most, probably the most well-known, the most egregious was the House passed bill in 2017, which very clearly weakened protections uh, the, on pre-existing conditions. I hope that he would uh, pledge again not to ever do that. Mr. Barletta, you may respond. Yeah, you know, obviously, if we want to continue scaring people uh, who have pre-existing conditions, uh, you know, I know personally how offensive that is when someone, a politician, will, will do anything to get elected. Nobody's going to deny anybody with pre-existing conditions. But maybe we should talk about why we had to replace Obamacare in the first place. The fact that our premiums went up to 114 percent, our deductibles, our, our out-of-pocket costs are, are so high that people aren't even going to the doctors anymore. How about all the millions of people who have been hurt by Obamacare, and that's why we're trying to replace it in the first place? Mr. Casey, you get the last word on this one. Well, first of all, the Affordable Care Act, in terms of Pennsylvania, made sure that 1.1 million people have coverage. That's a good thing, Congressman, for both, for both parties in, in the whole state. When the guy next to you has health insurance, well, you're better off. I'd also say that there's no question now that we have better protections because of the Affordable Care Act. That applies to anyone with insurance. I think it was an advancement. We can't go back to the dark days when an insurance company had the power to deny you a treatment coverage or, or charge you a higher rate. Next question goes to Lynn Hayes-Freeland. And my question is directed to you, Mr. Casey. Amazon recently announced plans to raise the minimum wage to $15 per hour, effective November the 1st. That's two times the federal minimum wage, which has not been increased in the past nine years. Mr. Casey, do you believe that all workers deserve to earn at least a living wage of $15 an hour? And if so, how do you balance that with the pushback from employers who say they can't afford it and they may have to lay off workers if they're forced into the increase? Len, your, your question points to a, a key issue for uh, voters in this election, and that's the question of wages. Who is going to be on your side to, tr to take affirmative steps to lift wages? When it comes to the minimum wage, I have a long record of supporting uh, increase in the minimum wage, but it's been far too long uh, in the intervening time period when we raised it last at the federal level, back to 2007. I voted already, or supported already, I should say, legislation that would that would bring the minimum wage up to at least $12, I think we should also make sure that two things happen. One, that inflation is taken into account in the future so that that wage can continue to keep up with inflation. And that if a local community wants to go to $15 or even higher, that local communities should have that opportunity. It's one of the fastest ways to raise wages, and it's very good for children when their mom or their dad has a, an increase in their wages. Mr. Barletta. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, would, I would agree with a modest increase of, of, of the minimum wage. However, the best way to uh, raise wages is to grow the economy. It was exactly what we're doing now. The fact that competition for employees is what really drives wages up. And, and government interference with, with the economy and trying to go back to uh, a stagnant economy that saw people, their hours cut and their wages cut or, and, and layoffs coming. Right now, we have one of the greatest economies that we've ever seen in our lifetime. And the fact that there's a competition, there are actually more jobs for pe than there are people who are unemployed. That's what drives wages. When, when, when you want to get the economy going and wages, you, you, uh, you grow the economy, and that's what's uh, going to raise wages, not government uh, artificially raising wages to $15 an hour. That will actually cost people their jobs. Let me just follow up because you said a modest increase. So do you believe that $10 an hour is a living wage? Because, for example, calculations indicate that you both make about $84 I'm, an hour. You know, I, w I wouldn't uh, 
put put a dollar figure on on that today. I think the economy. Let's see what the economy is doing. Amazon raised those wages to fifteen dollars on their own. You know, so if if we put a ten dollar an hour uh, a tag on on what wages should be, maybe Amazon would have only paid those folks ten dollars an hour instead of fifteen. Let's let the market determine what the wages are. They did that on their own without government interference. Mr. Casey. Just in terms of some history here, uh, when the new administration uh, took over in January of 2017, they inherited a growing economy, growing at a very fast clip, taking what was a the, the worst downturn since the 1930s and turning it into a growing economy. I'm glad it's still growing. I'm glad the unemployment rate is low. But, but here's the, I think here's the other thing we should do, coupling with an, an increase in the minimum wage. We should come together in a bipartisan middle class a substantial uh, tax cut paid for by the top one percent. The top one percent in the legislation that the congressman voted for are getting 83 percent of the benefits. That's wrong. The, the, those, those boosts in, in, uh, in pay by way of a tax cut should go to the I think we should come together, give the middle class a Time is up, boost. Senator. Hope the congressman would join me. Hey, Mr. Barletta, final word? It's amazing. Coming off uh, an administration that grew the econ economy at 2.2%, we're now, I guess today it was 3.5% is the new GDP numbers. We were up at 4.2%. The fact that, that 4 million new jobs were created uh, because, of, because of the tax cuts and rolling back regulations, somehow, I don't know what policy it is that Senator Casey's talking about, that waited eight years to actually come alive. I think, I think the reason the economy took off is because they were out of power. And, and, and small, business consumer, small business confidence and consumer confidence went through the roof because of that. The economy is growing because of the tax cuts and the rollback of regulations, and that's what's driving it. They don't understand how to get the economy going. Thank you, gentlemen. All right, let's, let's talk a little bit more about the economy because, frankly, voters' impressions of who, which party deserves the credit for the good economy, that can, that can be a deciding factor in this upcoming election. So, we have President Trump claiming all the credit for the current economy. President Obama has come out very forcefully and said, no, it's all the result of his policies. Mr. Barletta, because this matters, what is the truth? And please back it up with specifics. Well, I'd like Senator Casey to tell us what exact policy it was in their administration that is responsible for this. Was it the more regulations? The, the, was, it, was it Obamacare? Was it, I mean, what was it that they did? Higher taxes? Uh, I, I can't find what policy would be. Well, the fact of the matter is the economy took off when we rolled back taxes, we allowed businesses to grow, we gave them some more of their own money, they invested it, they hired more people. We rolled back regulations so that businesses can actually compete here in the United States once again. Because of this administration, because of our policies, we, the United States has once again become the most competitive country in the world. And businesses are moving back here. We now have a shortage of, of employees, and I don't know what policy it was in eight years that could have caused that, that waited, hibernated for eight years, and then all of a sudden showed its head when, uh, when our administration came into uh, power. And here are the facts. Uh, we all remember where we were in the last quarter of 2008, where the, the, the growth rate, if you can even use the word growth, was minus 8.9%, almost 9% negative. By the time President Obama left office, it was in the positive uh, by 1.8 percent. So he and Democrats turned around an economy which was decidedly, definitively in the ditch, number one, on growth. Number two, the unemployment rate in his first year got as high as 10 percent. The month he left office was about 4.8 percent. Now we're, we're below four and that's good. But so this idea that somehow the, the magic was created starting in January of 2017 is a big lie and everyone knows it. We're all glad when the economy grows. But the congressman and his party didn't lift a finger to grow the economy in those years. In fact, most Republicans were either voting against the Recovery Act or arguing against the Recovery Act. They did nothing to grow the economy. Democrats did the job. We want to keep doing the job to grow the economy. The best way to do that Time's up. is to give the middle class a tax cut. Mr. Barletta, you can rebut. So I, I didn't hear what policy it was that created, that waited eight years to, uh, to create this economy that's soaring right now. I didn't hear it. I do, remember, I do remember President Obama saying 
2% per, two growth, get used to it. That's the new norm. And what's this next president going to do? Wave a magic wand? Well, he must, have, he must have a magic wand because we are in the middle of the greatest economy in our lifetime. Mr. Casey, final word on this. I'll, I'll let it go. Go ahead. Is there, a, is there a specific policy you'd like to point to and take up uh, Mr. Barletta on that challenge? A specific what? A specific Democratic Obama policy that you would, that your party might claim is the, re the real reason the economy is doing so well Des today? Despite the denigration from Republican politicians in Washington who genuflect every day to the big corporate special interests, the Recovery Act is the reason we began uh, to recover years ago. Got, had the longest period of growth in, in the history of the country. So we got the economy out of the ditch. What they did when they took over, you know what they did? They do what they always do. They, they try to cut programs like Medicare and Medicaid, and then they give a, a tax cut for major corporations. They gave $2 trillion in permanent tax relief, jacking up the debt for the American people, and they gave away the store to the top 1%. All right, Mr. Barletta. The playbook. They cut programs for people, and they give the rich and big corporations. Go ahead, see if you can... Talk about that. Mr. Barlett, I'll let you respond. Yeah, sure. Let's talk about the $718 billion that was taken out of Medicare. You want to talk about hurting Medicare? Not true. $718 billion was taken, rated out of Medicare to pay for Obamacare. $718 billion. You want to talk about who's hurting Medicare? Let me, let me you, I'll back. give you 10 seconds and I want to follow up. Go ahead. Medicare benefits were not cut in the Affordable Care Act. Why would the AARP support the Affordable Care Act if it cut Medicare? That's a lie and he knows it. Mr. Barletta, do you agree with the Treasury Secretary, Steven Mnuchin, who said that the stock market is the administration's scorecard? Do you agree with it now after we've seen uh, you know, quite a decline? The Dow has closed down for five straight weeks. I think it's part of it, obviously. It's, it, it's part of the scorecard. I think the fact that, that we have more people in the workforce now than ever before. I think the fact that um, African-American unemployment's at an all-time low, Hispanic unemployment's at an all-time low. But the question is, if you can claim credit for a strong stock market, do you also have to take blame when it's not doing so well? Well, let's, let's okay, let's, let's make believe that this administration and the Republicans weren't in charge at all. You know what that means? That means the stock market goes down by 20 percent. Since this administration is in office, the stock market is up over 20 percent overall. That's pretty good for people that have 401ks. Let's, not, let's take it from the beginning of where we were and where we are now. Mr. Case, I'll let you weigh in and then we'll move on. Yeah, I'm, we're, we're always happy. If someone's 401k is up, that's great. If unemployment keeps going down, that's, that's wonderful. We all support that. Here's the problem. Costs have not gone down. The cost of child care is too high that we have to get down. The cost of health care, I wish they would join us instead of trying to repeal protections for people with pre-existing conditions. Let's get the cost of health care down. Let's work together to get the cost of prescription drugs down. That's why my importation bill would, would uh, begin to solve that problem. Right. And also, let's do our best to help families save for college and retirement. Thank you. John Delano, next can, question. Can I just, I just, now we need to move on. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, Mr. Casey. We've all seen Mr. Barletta's ad, presumably photoshopped, showing you asleep on the job and suggesting that you are one of the least effective senators in, uh, Cap on Capitol Hill. Now, you've been in the Senate for 12 years, but when you go out on the street and talk to people and ask them, what has Senator Casey done, they blank. What is it? Is that a fair measure of your performance in the Senate? Or is there something specific that you can point to that you're most proud of that most of us in Pennsylvania may not be aware of? Well, John, first of all, the, the ad, of course, is not fair, but I get, I'm glad I have some equal time here. Number one is um, if, you, if you measure someone's uh, work as a legislator by bills enacted into law, uh, since, since uh, this term of my time in the Senate began, we're hovering, we're getting close to 50 bills. Uh, that have been enacted into law. The ones that will have the most impact, I think, on people's lives here in Pennsylvania and around the country would be first the ABLE Act, which for the first time allowed uh, families that have a loved, one, a loved one with a disability to save in a tax advantage way, just like it's safe for college, almost like a 529 plan for disabilities. It gives families great peace of mind. That, that will have national impact for generations. The second bill that I'm very proud of that was bipartisan was making sure that on college campuses we have more protections in place for young women who could be the victims of sexual assault. That is the law of the land starting, it was implemented in the fall of 15, so we have 
four years now of that bill being in place. I'm very proud of a bipartisan record. And I look forward to talking about it more. That adds, uh, Mr. Casey, is just plain wrong? Sure it is, but I'm, I would expect that. Mr. Barlett. So if we look at the report card, we, we need to really compare Senator Casey's record with our other senators that we've had. And Senator Toomey, who's there four less years, has 50 percent more bills passed. Senator Santorum had double the amount of bills passed than Senator Casey. Senator Specter had 30 bills passed. Senator Hines had 26 bills passed. Our Senator Casey had four. Uh, he, in fact, his report card is so bad that he was voted one of the least effective senators in Congress, not once, but twice. And as far as the ABLE Act, which I co-sponsored, it's amazing that that you wouldn't have uh, supported our bill that would have allowed another $12,000 on top of the $15,000 limit that, that could be saved, that you would not support a bill that actually put another $12,000 on it that you voted against that. You voted against your own bill. That's amazing. Mr. Well, Casey. Well, first of all, I'd be interested to see those numbers on, on other senators. The fact of the matter is I have at least 45 bills this, uh, in this term that are, are, have been enacted into law. Bills that have far-reaching effect on people's lives. Bills that are bipartisan. I'd ask the, the congressman to weigh just between the two of us and, and since the new administration. He's very close to the administration. He claims to, to work with them on a number of fronts. But here, here we have legislation that I have passed that President Trump has signed into law. My grand family's bill to help gr grandparents who are raising a child because of the opioid crisis. That, that online tool Quickly, is now, is now the, the law of the land. Secondly, the career and technical education bill that I did with Mike Enzi of Wyoming, that's signed into law. So if it's just bills signed into law by, in the recent past by President Trump, Time's I'll up. win that battle. Yeah, I'm going to come back. Mr. Barletta, can you respond to the question of what you have done sure. as a lawmaker? Sure. First of all, I've saved $4.4 billion using my experience as a, in, the, in the private sector in, in shrinking the federal footprint uh, of, of the federal government, 4.4 billion and growing. I had two opioid bills that that were passed. I have, uh, 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 the, you know, I think the most proudest thing that I did wasn't actually a bill. It, it was a little girl called Sarah Murnahan who had cystic fibrosis, and the government was going to deny that little girl a lung transplant because she was 10 years old and not 12. And, and I actually uh, got involved and, and and helped raise this this question. But if you know, I, I think. Uh, you know, the, the, I, just have to, I just have to say, the career tech education bill that he's talking about, taking credit for, it started in the House. It was G.T. Thompson's bill. In fact, I got language in it before you even saw it. So I'm glad you signed on to our bill. Thank you. All right, next question. Lynn Hayes Freeland for Mr. Barletta. Mr. Barletta, from Florida to Georgia, we've seen new voting restrictions put into place that many are interpreting as voter suppression, often aimed at African-American voters. In 2012, a proposed Pennsylvania voter ID requirement, which some top Republicans admitted was designed to suppress Democratic votes, was ruled unconstitutional. With little to no actual evidence of fraud, why is the Republican Party so worried about voter fraud? Well, I, I think there's a lot of focus in Washington uh, about making sure we're protecting the, uh, uh, our elections with all the focus on the Russians' involvement uh, in, in the last election. I would think that it would be natural that we would also say, let's make sure that right here at home there's no voter fraud. And, uh, you know, that just seems to me to be reasonable that we're protecting, because there is a lot of focus about interference in our elections until, until it comes to at home where we say, well, let's not be too careful about whether somebody can vote or not. I think we need to make sure that we protect our elections, whether it's from foreign countries' interference or whether it's from fraud right here on our homeland. But here in Pennsylvania in 2016, there were only three reported cases of voter fraud. There should be no, there should be no voter fraud. I think we should all be able to, to go to the polls and know that on election night that, that there cannot be anyone, whether it's from a foreign country. I mean, we spent a lot of time on Russians' interference with our, with our election, but yet when it comes to right here at home, we want to be a little, little less stringent. I think, I think we should protect the, di the, the, the dignity of our election process whether it's from abroad or it's right here at home. Mr. Casey, your take? 
And let's be blunt about it. There's no voter fraud problem in the United States of America, okay? Um, Republican politicians want to use this as a tool uh, to, I guess, please some, some interest group out there that thinks uh, that there is. The, the evidence is very clear, and it's irrefutable. It's not, we don't have a voter fraud problem. What we should do is come together, and I hope the congressman would support this, and, and support in a bipartisan fashion legislation introduced in the House and the Senate to say if we have to update the Voting Rights Act and, and, and uh, uh, provide uh, uh, corrections that are the result of a Supreme Court case from a couple years ago, the Shelby County case, we should come together and do that to make sure that voting rights are protected. We had this fight. We had this fight over generations. People bled and died for the right to vote. It culminated in the Voting Rights Act in the mid-60s. We should make sure that those protections are in place. I would hope that he would call the Department of Justice and say, enforce the law with, with regard to voting rights, make sure more people can vote. I would not want to be part of a Time's up. party that wanted to shrink the number of voters. Thank you, gentlemen. Mr. Casey, uh, President Trump says there are scientists on both sides of the issue of global warming and whether human activity is causing it. The president says that the climate changes back and forth and therefore he's not about to sacrifice our economy for something that nobody really knows. Do you know for sure, Senator, that climate change is real, caused by man, and that this isn't all a conspiracy to fool people? And I, I think the, the evidence is overwhelming uh, across the, the world that climate change is real, uh, that it does pose a threat to human life itself, and secondly, that, uh, that it's caused by man. We can take actions uh, to, to push back against this. We're up against a time limit, I think. We're, we're coming, I'm not, don't, not sure what year, but there's a, there's a time limit. We've got to make sure we put in place measures to do that. Two things that this administration did, which is in contravention of that. Number one, pulling out of the Paris Climate Accords so that we can't be part of a, a consensus around the world to take action against climate change. And second, to make sure that we put in place the Clean Power Plan which would help us deal with our own challenges here. This, is, this challenge is a worldwide challenge, but I think here at home we've got to lead and we've got to make sure that we're reducing emissions here in a manner that will push back uh, against the, the, the darkness of climate change. This is a mission worthy of a great country. We can do this. Mr. Barletta, just to look at the other side of this, uh, let me reframe it. The National Climate Assessment is a scientific report reviewed by 13 federal agencies and actually approved by the Trump White House. And that assessment says that long-term global warming, that trend is clear. And that there is no convincing evidence that it's merely natural variability, as the president has suggested. Why do some politicians, like you, I believe, substitute your judgment for that of the top scientists that much of the government puts stock in? We spend a lot of time trying to find the, what we believe, an argument of whether it's man-made, whether it's cyclical, and we spend a heck of a lot of time doing that. I, I agree that there is climate change. Whether it's man-made or it's not, we have climate change. So therefore, let's do what we can on the man-made side to make sure that we're not contributing to, uh, to, to uh, affecting our planet. And the United States does a good job of it. When we over-regulate, though, here in the United States, we push these companies into countries like China, where the regulations are, are less, and they get to pollute even more. We do more harm to our planet by over-regulating American companies, trying to do our share in their share, and we actually push companies out, out uh, into another, uh, another country where they could pollute even more. We should be doing the opposite, which we are. Let's bring these companies back here where we have fair regulations. Hard to be a senator and be out here in Western PA and be against coal and be against natural gas, which is just amazing to me. When natural gas is one of the cleanest forms of energy we can have, we have a a pencil Time is up, sir. That's against both. Senator? We just made that up. That's not true, uh, number one. Number two is there's no question that when it comes to this issue, we have to take action. At the same time, and I'll be critical of my own party here, at the same time, we need right alongside that a substantial jobs program to make sure that if someone loses their job because of actions we take on climate change, that we try to get them a job, we give them the training, we invest in those workers. That's what we should do as a country. We can do both. We're Americans. We can figure this out. The idea that you have to choose jobs 
versus dealing with climate change is just a, is a political argument only in Washington. Mr. Barletta, final word on this. So, so to go back to natural gas, which is, which is these are family sustaining jobs right here. People, our communities out here are depending on that. Our senator led the charge. He didn't just join it. He led the charge to put federal regulations on top of already state regulations to put the gas companies out of business. Right here in Western PA, not only those families are depending on those jobs, but these communities are depending on those jobs. We already said he heard he hates coal. He wants to put the coal companies out of business. Now he wants to put the natural gas companies out of business, which would devastate Western all of Pennsylvania. Got to leave it there. We are going to take a break. We will continue with more of our KDK U.S. Senate debate right after this.